So, hi everyone, I'm Lorna Stabler, I'm a research fellow at Cascade, um, and I'm just going to introduce the study, and then at the end I'm going to take some questions. Um, because we've got quite a few people joining us, we're just going to take questions in the chat today. So do put your questions in the chat all the way through the presentation, and then at the end I'll group them together by theme and ask um, ask them to Sarah and hopefully get all the responses that you want, but she'll also share her contact details. So if you want to follow up afterwards um, on anything that's been shared, please do feel free to do so. Um, and you'll see some links will come into the chat as well if you want any kind of follow up information. Um, so thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sarah McDonald from Decipher, who is going to talk about a project that she has been leading, focusing on the mental health and well-being of children and young people um, who are care experienced in schools and colleges in Wales. Um, I'm sure for anyone who's joining us who work with care experienced young people, there's a real area of kind of interest and concern that's raised in lots of research. Um, you know, the, the struggles that the children may have kind of navigating education, um, particularly kind of how that intersects with the relationships that they have or don't have and um, with professionals in their lives. Um, so Sarah, we're very much looking forward to hearing from you and I'll pass over to you now. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, lovely to be here. And thanks very much, Lorna, for, for chairing today's session. And thanks also to um, Sean and all the team at Exchange for organising today as well. So I just wanted to start um, with this first slide by referencing a number of colleagues um, who have also been involved in the study. So I was co-lead with um, Gillian Hewitt, who, um, we both were based in Decipher. Um, our colleague Sean Jones is based in the School of Social Sciences at Cardiff University. Um, he's done lots of work in schools and colleges and he, he undertook some of the um, interviews for us in Welsh. Um, we've been sort of steered on the study by a group who provided regular input um, and guidance, and that included Rachel Brown, who's also leading the um, evaluation of the whole school approach in Wales at the moment. And she works across um, Decipher and also the um, Wolfson Young People's Mental Health Research um, Group. Becky Anthony as well um, also works across Decipher and Wilson and she supported us with the quantitative analysis um, of some of the school's data. And then Alison Rees and Rhiannon and Evans really provided senior level advice um, and mentoring for both myself and Gillian. Um, and they're based, so Alison's based in Cascade and Rhiannon in Decipher. I'd also like to say that we were supported by um, a project advisory group um, and that included representatives from colleges and schools, um, also the Foster Network, National Adoption Service, Foster Wales and the Young People's Group Voices from Care. So it was a really um, supportive team to be part of. So the study that I'm going to talk about today is called WISC, Wellbeing in Schools and Colleges, and it was funded by Health and Care Research Wales through a social care grant and was completed earlier this year. So today's session will give a little bit of background, um, um, an insight into the methods, especially the qualitative methods that we drew on. Um, the main part of the presentation will focus on the methods, on the findings and the headline findings. Um, and then report some of the recommendations and just talk through some of our plans for next steps. So the starting point for the study really um, is that mental health and well-being um, of care experienced children and young people is a real public health and social care priority in Wales. And then there's evidence from Wales and internationally of worse mental health and well-being among care experienced um, children and young people when compared to the general population. But alongside that, um, educational settings have become key and really important for supporting uh, mental health and well-being of all children and young, young people. But there seem to be limited services or limited support specifically for care experienced learners. 
And what we found that addressing that gap is a real challenge. Um, there's little evidence of effective interventions for that group and quite poor understanding of how health, education um, and social care sectors might work together in that space, um, particularly at key times, such as um, when young people move from secondary school to further education college. So that's already been identified as a time of a peak, peaks in need um, for well-being. So therefore, the aim of the, um, the WISC study was really to better understand how mental health and well-being support in secondary schools and colleges is both experienced by those who deliver and receive it, um, including how the education, social care and uh, mental health sectors work together, and try and use that understanding to recommend how support could be developed and improved in the future. So within the study, um, we use quite a broad definition of care experience to include those in foster care, residential care, kinship care, those with special guardianship orders, and also those who were adopted as well. And in terms of mental health and well-being, um, the study tried to reflect sort of the current, current policy context um, with a particular interest in how schools and colleges support day-to-day -day well-being and really prevent progression to more severe mental health need. So WISC was um, a mixed method study with three main elements. Um, so firstly, in terms of the secondary data analysis, um, we've drawn on a completed school-based survey undertaken by the School Health Research Network, or SHERN. Um, and the secondary analysis for this part of the study was led by our colleague, Becky, Becky Anthony. Um, secondly, we conducted a series of stakeholder consultations to identify really broad areas um, to explore. And then thirdly, um, we conducted a series of qualitative case studies with schools, colleges, social care teams and mental health teams across Wales. And these provided really more in-depth insights from several different perspectives within the same setting. And the focus today of, of today's findings really is on the qualitative study element, so numbers two and three in this list. So I'll just um, take a moment to say a little bit more about the stakeholder consultations. Um, these were held at the beginning and then again at the end of the study. So in the first round, um, we collected data from young people with experiences of foster care and adoption, also adopted parents and carers, um, and practitioners from education, social care and health. And just note a big thank you to our partner organisations here who help with recruiting and recruitment and hosting um, of those consultations. So that first phase really enabled um, us to identify broad areas to then explore in the case studies and also more specific questions maybe to include in the topic guide, such as um, questions about how learners' well-being needs vary even over a school or college day. Then at the end of the study, um, we undertook another round of consultations, um, and that was to feedback the findings, refine those findings, um, and also help take forward the recommendations. And at this later stage, um, we also included co a consultation with policymakers, and that also included national and regional stakeholders, so Welsh Government, Public Health Wales, and also third sector organisations as well. So I'll say a little bit um, now about the case studies and the methods we used there. Um, these were undertaken in four diverse local authority areas across Wales. So firstly, in two areas, we recruited one school um, and conducted interviews there with um, learners, also carers and adoptive parents and school staff. And then in two further areas, um, we also recruited one school and undertook interviews there. But here we also wanted to explore those wider um, mental health and wellbeing support systems, um, particularly around the transition to FE college. So in those other two areas, we also recruited a college, um, a social care team and um, a mental health team that supports schools as well. And across the, the whole set of case studies, we mainly focused on individual, individual interviews, but a few were focus groups as well. So um, this slide just shows the number of participants in the consultations and case studies. Um, in the case studies, we conducted a mix um, of interviews with a range of staff in schools, including teaching staff and pastoral staff. In social care teams, it was a mixture of managers and social workers. And in mental health teams, it was a mixture of um, specialist camp services 
and also those working in in school in reach services as well. So we would have liked to have spoken to more young people in schools and colleges and also more parents and carers linked with schools. Um, but the consultations were quite well attended by both of those groups. Um, so their perspectives came through there. So I'll go on now to present some of the headline findings um, and then move on to recommendations. So just as an overview to help navigate the findings, um, there are four main sections. So first of all, I'll talk a bit about needs across schools and colleges. Then looking at, at provision, um, what support was in place in both settings, as well as looking at challenges and facilitators. Then we want to look at how schools and colleges work with social care teams, and then finally look at how they work with mental health teams. And as I said, I'll just draw together some sort of um, recommendations, key recommendations for those settings at the end. So in terms of findings, firstly, looking at mental health and wellbeing needs. Um, needs were recognised as being very varied um, related to the wide range of reasons young people enter care. Um, commonly mentioned in schools were anxiety, low self-esteem and also, also struggles around um, and friendship groups. We found that needs also varied over time and staff, learners and carers were really in agreement um, about heightened need during the transition from primary school. So the learner here in this example um, spoke about anxiety increasing because they were also moving from a different area at the time. So there was lots of change, lots of different things going on um, and lots of new people to interact with. So other times of elevated need um, were linked to care related events, which could be triggers such as a new baby in the birth family. And teachers across schools noted um, problems generated in the, in the lead up to the long summer holiday. Um, they talked about this creating a period of loss of stability um, and support that young people may be found at school. I think it's also important to flag that um, for some young people, they were quite clear that they felt they had no needs. Um, so this learner was in a settled placement and despite changing schools, at that point said they were OK. Um, and other learners also echoed this and said that they knew support was available, but hadn't needed it. So needs at transition to college and college itself had many similarities, but there were some differences too. Um, a transition, a key worry was about losing the support care experience learners had at school, um, where some learners may have had the same um, person or same support in place for the last five years, and they were now uh, about to lose that. Um, so the example there was from the teaching assistant. Um, they, they picked up on that as something um, they observed amongst learners as they were coming towards the end of year 11. And then at college itself, um, higher, higher academic expectations impacted on well-being, and there were significant worries about money, managing that, and also about what was coming next in their lives. Um, adopted young people and parents in the consultations that we did really spoke about um, the time in college um, coinciding with resurfacing of questions about birth families. So that also impacted on wellbeing needs at this time. So just a few headlines about um, school support and what seemed to work well. So we found that being in school per se could be a source of support for some, some young people. Um, some describe their favourite lessons and clubs they are in. And adults in the school setting also highlighted the sort of constancy the school can offer in a, in a turbulent life. Being in school with friends was also related to that, and that was a source of support. Um, young people spoke about this and the importance of support from friends also came through um, in the carer interviews as well. Individualised support from school staff was really important. Um, so some schools had in place regular check-ins and that provided a means of daily contact um, and tailoring to, to individual needs. Um, so the example there from the ALN coordinator, um, the staff described, the member staff described daily check-ins every morning, just as a way to plan for the day ahead for that learner. And then rather than provision um, specifically designed for care experience learners, schools really seem to tailor existing support um, to, to individual learner needs. And central to that seemed to be this um, sort of encouraging, nurturing um, or, or gently nudging care experience learners to join in activities such as extracurricular clubs or school councils. 
Um, an example there from the Safeguard and Lead um, was characteristics across a number of interviews, really, where staff talked about this um, more subtle type of support and their nurturing role. In terms of gaps in provision in schools, no one really talked about support for adopted pupils. Um, this was something that came through quite prominently in the early consultations um, with re needs related to, to early life trauma. So we just made sure that we asked about that in the case studies. So what can we draw out about um, challenges and facilitators for wellbeing support in schools? In terms of the challenges, um, one thing that was really flagged was school staff's capacity to offer support and provision. And that meant in terms of physical capacity, time and funding, the staff also spoke about, spoke about the emotional capacity, capacity and resilience that staff needed to support learners. There was also a sense um, that this group of learners can be quite a challenging group to help. Um, and they didn't really want to be marked out as care experience. So the quote from the head of the year, um, their notes, you know, they wanted to be treated like everyone else. They didn't want to be seen as different. And then in terms of facilitators, um, relationships seemed key to everything, including relationships with young people themselves and also between schools and parents and carers. And staff knowing the care experience learners seemed crucial. Um, so their skills, their attitude, but also the sort of constancy in that role to help sustain those relationships. So the example there is from a year 12 learner who coming towards the end of the time in school was reflecting back um, on someone who'd been their designated contact. You know, she knew she was familiar. She knew my situation and that was important. And then also note about staff collaboration and teamwork. Um, staff spoke about sharing experiences, supporting each other and ensuring information was appropriately shared um, across the school. So as I said at the start, one of our areas of focus for the study um, was the transition from secondary school to FE college and what support was in place. So in some cases, there seemed to be quite close working between secondary schools and colleges. So they identified key experience learners, um, provided some sort of enhanced support, maybe prioritising access to careers advice, and maybe they arranged um, visits to the college at quieter times so that the change wasn't so overwhelming. Um, in some cases as well, schools um, passed on information about maybe mechanisms or practices that seemed to work well in school and that would help the learner as they moved into college. I think it's also important to note um, the quite mixed experience of transition support um, and especially in some of the consultations, young people described having no clear guidance on post-16 choices and no information about wellbeing support. And then looking at what was in place um, in colleges beyond transition, um, colleges tended to have dedicated pastoral support, um, which was aimed at building relationships from the start. And they seemed quite tuned in to um, when students may need more help. So, for example, there were cases of pastoral and academic staff working together in a college to support a student when they were moving to independent living. So similar to schools in a way, quite individualised support um, at times responding to specific needs. Financial support was important um, and that included help with clothing and equipment. And as one of the young, young people's advisors noted, um, that really linked to wellbeing because it was just one less thing for them to worry about. Gaps um, at college, again, provision for adopters seems to be overlooked um, and feedback from young people in the um, adopted consultation group confirmed this. Um, they really said that a future priority was that we need college staff with experience of adoption. So participants also spoke about barriers and challenges to providing wellbeing support in college. Um, student desire for anonymity, so same across schools and colleges, that common theme around care experience young people not wanting to be seen as a group or treated any differently. And at this stage, that really links to what they said about growing independence and in some cases just wanting a fresh start in college. Um, a big barrier for college staff was really identifying who was care experienced on entry. Um, they really wanted to put in place that enhanced support that we described, um, but often had limited information either from schools or local authorities. So they really felt they were on the back heel in some cases in terms of knowing their new cohort of students. Um, and that was more of a challenge then when they were maybe working across multiple local authorities um, or where they also had out of area students as well. And then looking at what really helped or worked well in colleges, 
Um, college staff spoke about engaging with um, foster care and start and how that really helped with making sure all the support was in place. And having a range of staff available um, in colleges seemed to, to really help. So students liked the fact that they had pastoral staff to go to, maybe their personal tutor, lecturing staff, and possibly on-site counsellors as well. So the, the quote from the college student there um, highlights the benefits of having lots of different people that they could go to. So just move on now to the findings about um, how social care and schools work together in supporting um, care experience young people. So just a reminder here of who we spoke to, um, we interviewed local authority based child services and foster care teams, um, including social care managers and social workers. And in terms of challenges, um, working together um, was harder where there may be the different attitudes towards care experience and social workers reflected on how they had very different experiences of collaboration um, across different schools. Uh, the schools building relationships seemed to be harder due to uh, maybe social work team capacity and um, perhaps they didn't have as much time to collaborate as schools that might have wanted them to. But there were some very um, good relationships and collaborations and these are really facilitated by um, frequent regular contact and also having a name person in schools for social workers to deal with. Um, one important development to flag here really is the virtual school. Um, that really helped to facilitate links between schools and social workers. So this is a new pilot system in Wales um, where there's a head teacher who is not based in the school, but oversees the education of um, care experience learners in the area, whichever school they are in. And the final quote um, on this slide, I think, speaks to that. So schools describe really positive links with social workers being driven by the virtual school. They often help them find the right social work team to contact and they also help schools um, when they head out of area placements as well. So just turn this look at um, how colleges um, work with social care teams. Some challenges there were, were that um, maybe social workers were less involved in college, often because young people maybe wanted more independence at that stage. And one challenge that really came through was about um, the organisation of care related meetings, um, which, which seemed to be a, a challenge and also a source of anxiety for students as this often impacted on their timetables. Um, so there's a real sense of how young people maybe um, felt marginalised or unable to express opinions about meeting logistics. Um, and they really felt that sort of um, challenge of juggling care appointments and attending college. In terms of facilitators there, um, as with schools, having a named person in the college, um, the social workers contact was really helpful, as was the um, young person's advisor role, um, so someone who supports them from the age of 16, um, and that was really spoken about in positive terms. So a couple of um, slides to finish the findings really, just on um, how schools and colleges work with mental health teams. So a reminder here of how we, who we spoke to. So the interviews were conducted with specialist CAM services who have a remit of working with schools and also the schools in reach services. Um, so a relatively new service which aims to build capacity in schools to support learners' mental health and well-being um, and also improve schools' access to specialist services when needed. So in terms of challenges, um, Practitioners that we spoke to observed variation between schools in terms of their understanding of um, and the significance of early life trauma. Um, a further barrier, especially came across in small and rural schools, was maybe limited capacity to cover meetings with um, CAMs and maybe in reach services. And then on the facilitator side, um, they really spoke about positive relationships with inReach. Um, they received regular visits from CAMS inReach. And although their focus is not care experience learners, this seemed to facilitate overall joint working through staff training, opportunities for staff um, supervision, um, and also sessions for parents and carers on wellbeing as well. And as the example there, um, notes from the school where being lead if in reach services had really helped schools better understand who to go to for external support. Um, also worth noting that in reach practitioners often had a range of professional backgrounds so some of them were former teachers, some of them were social workers and this also seemed to facilitate that joint working. 
One school that we came across um, had more regular contact with sort of specialist CAMs as maybe nearly, I think most of their care experience learners were being supported by the service. And that school spoke about um, really valuing regular contact from a CAM specialist practitioner for care experienced young people. And um, that was a new role, um, someone that came to school to work with learners, also provided support for teachers. And the CAMS manager that we spoke to in this example, they also flagged that as a, a crucial new role that really seemed to span um, mental health, social care, schools and home settings as well. And then in terms of joint working between colleges and mental health teams. So some of the challenges there, um, college staff often reported maybe feeling overwhelmed when students um, were discharged from CAMS and maybe concerns that they weren't able to offer ongoing specialist support. And in terms of facilitating the role between college um, and mental health teams, um, there was close work in some cases and they experienced consistent contact. And the staff we spoke to really appreciated sort of receiving, receiving feedback about students. Um, so that was a positive aspect as well. So just as by way of concluding the presentation, really, um, I'll draw together some of the main points and summarise main, some of the main recommendations. Um, just a little note on how we drew these together. So the draft recommendations are presented and discussed with our study advisory group, and they provided really useful feedback. Um, and then another iteration of the recommendations were shared with stakeholders in that final round of consultations, and they were further refined and adjusted um, and included in the final report to funders. So very interested maybe today in your any of any of your reflections on these and how they could be taken forward. So first of all, recommendations for schools, um, and these recommendations stem from the finding about um, being in school, being good for some care experience learners, well-being. And it's just really stuck in our mind that when we spoke to one head teacher, you know, and when we asked what their what their real needs are, they said that you know, they just need to feel that they belong. So that's um, that brings in that first recommendation there, and also the importance of friendship groups as well. The second one there is around adopted um, young people and the finding that very little seems to be in place and awareness of their needs is low. And then in some of the consultations, we had some suggestions about how and that could be addressed, um, maybe specific responsibility for a school governor or improve resourcing of the virtual school role so that they can better support adopted young people. And then the final one, final point there for schools is around staff's mental health well and well-being, recognising the need for um, a well-supported workforce, but suggesting that the responsibility for that should be shared um, across schools, local authorities and Welsh Government, and suggestions including maybe further training to build confidence, supervision support, and also possibly um, networking um, across different schools. So moving on to some of the recommendations for colleges, and this really relates to transition from secondary school. So the two parts to this, first of all, um, the first part relates to the way that we found that transition support was in place for some, but not all um, students or for not all schools and colleges. Um, so we're just suggesting maybe to have one person to oversee that process. And then secondly, um, also suggesting that the transition process itself could be um, strengthened by schools and colleges collaborating on a more long term basis, and perhaps working in the same way that primary and secondary schools work together in the cluster model. Um, so interestingly, in, in one of the um, stakeholder consultations at the end, someone flagged up that um, as part of their school, they do have that ongoing links with colleges so that teachers in the school get to find out about students after they have moved on. So we also included a recommendation then for improving multi-agency working, um, which you can read on this slide. So the first part there um, is about the importance of different professional groups understanding each other. We recommended that that could be enhanced by people with different backgrounds and different services. So social workers and mental health teams, or perhaps head teachers sitting on foster care panels, which um, someone mentioned seems to be happening in some places, perhaps not everywhere. And then we also saw value in the data of these spanner roles. Um, so these roles that have specific responsibility to work across services, a bit like the virtual um, head teacher role, um, and also the CAM specialist practitioner role. 
Um, so we're suggesting further investment in those sorts of spanner roles. And then just rounding off um, in terms of our next steps. Um, so we're preparing a series of policy briefings um, for um, policymakers, practitioners, and also young people. Um, and we'll also share those more widely through, through policy and practice. A few papers that are in the pipeline. Um, first one there is based more on the quantitative analysis, so that's um, been submitted. And then two further papers, one focusing more on needs and support available, and then the second one focusing more on multi-agency working. Um, I think we're aiming to send those one to more of an education-focused journal and one to more social care journals. So just trying to split papers across um, different disciplines to extend the reach. Um, so through, um, we've also got ongoing links with the whole school evaluation, which is continuing until next year. So some of the findings I've presented today have um, a lot of synergy with the whole school evaluation, especially around the importance of relationships, feeling safe and belonging in school, and also the importance of friendships. Um, so as I said, the lead on that evaluation, Rachel Brown, is also a co-op on this study. So we're looking at ways to bring those findings together. And then the other aspect is um, a Health and Care Research Wales prioritisation project. Um, that's, I think, in the early stages at the moment, but we're looking at key questions to address for this population group. Um, and we've got a meeting um, with other researchers towards the end of this month. So we'll find out a bit more about that at that stage. Okay, so um, thank you. Yeah, thanks to everyone who took part um, and also our partner organisations as well. And I've got some references that have been included in the presentation here. And I've also got some further information um, that's, that links to tell you a little bit more about the study if you'd like to follow up afterwards. Um, I think that's a, an exchange blog and also a couple of presentations that we've already done. Um, and we will circulate the briefings and the other presentation, the other publications through exchange in due course as well. So thank you very much for listening and coming along today. Um, and as Lorna said at the start, happy to take questions now, but um, you've got my contact detail there as well, if you'd like to get in touch afterwards. So thank you. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. It was really, really interesting. And I think we've got some um, interesting questions in the chat. And also I've got a couple of my own questions um, that I'd like to, to bring to you. But um, if anyone does have any other questions or anything that you think of as me and Sarah are talking, please just pop them in the chat um, and I can I can ask them to Sarah as well. So, um, yeah, thank you very much. I think that there's one, there's a couple of questions and comments around how what you found might actually cross over into other populations. So I was just wondering if um, you could say a little bit more about what you think might be unique to kind of care experienced young people and their mental health and well-being in schools, as opposed to potentially children with kind of complex or additional needs or children who are kind of living in kind of under-resourced households um, and things like that. So I'm imagining some, some will be relevant across and some will be quite specific. That's really good. Something I'll probably have to think a little bit more about as well. But thank you, Lorna. Um, so I think the, I did, probably didn't have time to present it all today. But um, so when we, we spoke to especially schools, um, so we did go in with that approach in terms of um, what wellbeing support is available for all students. Um, and then asked questions about, um, sorry, and this came through in the, in the data as well as us asking about it, what what was in place um, in terms of being more targeted. Um, so that was for more vulnerable learners across the school. And then thirdly, what was there anything specific that was for um, care experience learners as well? So that was, I kind of guess, in the background all, all through. Um, I think I think maybe I'll have to think about, yeah, all of this can apply across, across vulnerable learners. And I think... But I think um, thinking back to what young people told us quite early on um, in those consultations and the early work we did on this, it was it was really about awareness raising. So it was wanting to have in schools and colleges that awareness 
of perhaps what care experience had been. And then again, from the carers that we spoke to, what it was like to be a foster carer and what that entailed. So I think probably there's, and you can, you know, you, that's important across all those vulnerable groups as well, but that was key for um, the care experienced um, learners that we spoke to. Yeah, I think that's such a good point as well, Sarah, because I think, um, you know, care experienced young people can also fit into all of those mm -hmm. other groups. Um, but there is something kind of quite unique about that experience of potentially having been removed from your family, you know, potentially not being with siblings, potentially having to move to schools and kind of losing kind of friend groups that's very linked to the experience of coming into care and potentially moving through different kind of households and things like that, that is an additional, potentially an additional barrier, an additional kind of um, impact on people's mental health and well-being. So, yeah, I think I think it's important to kind of think about that, what's unique, but also that care experiencing people are overrepresented um, in other kind of vulnerabilities as well. Um, so, yeah, I think that's really good to reflect on. And um, we had another um, question as well about kind of universal approaches as opposed to approaches that are specific for care experiencing people. And I think obviously the whole school approach kind of touches on that. But I just wonder if you might want to say a little bit more about kind of the difference between kind of some of the positive kind of universal approaches that would also support care experiencing people and what might be different for something that's specific to care experiencing people. Okay, so yeah, so this has come up yeah, in discussions with the um, whole school approach, like you say, so, and people did refer to that. So I think, you know, the whole school approach and um, improving the overall ethos of well-being throughout the school, not just in the curriculum, but in terms of every every contact point and the whole school population. Um, that was really that that was really important. Um, I think I think we've also had discussions about. Um, not sure if I'm the best person to speak on this, but how you know just improving that universal um, support actually does support care experienced learners as well. So it's improving it for everyone. Um, and that would help all the different groups within within the school setting. Um, I think I think what struck us, I think when we went into this, we and people were asking us, you know, what what interventions in place, what particular support. And I think it's when I spoke in the presentation about it was more about an approach or practice that was different mm. and how um you know, educationalists, teachers, pastoral workers adapted their approach to encourage um, care experienced learners in a different way or um, perhaps a bit more than other learners. So it was far more about those quite subtle practices um, than anything more wide ranging in place. Yeah, and I think we found that with other studies as well, that there's not necessarily specific targeted interventions for care experiencing people. That's not to say that maybe they wouldn't be beneficial, but I guess all that people can talk about is what they do, um, as opposed to, you know, things that they could potentially imagine might be might be helpful. Um, but I think that has come up quite a bit. It's, it's more about people who are working with young people acknowledging and understanding what what people's care experience might be what that might mean when you talk about family when what it might mean when you talk about home and acknowledging that actually you know children might be kind of going through a court process or something in the background of school as well and, and being very aware of that um so I think you did talk about how kind of different teams might work together with schools to support children and young people and um, we do have a question about if there was anything that captured but there was captured specifically about how children's social care and mental health teams work together to support care experiencing people so kind of what their relationship is like almost outside of the school environment as well yeah, okay no thank you I think um <clears throat> sorry when I was looking through the slides again I thought that was a bit of a of an over ever gap really in terms so I did sort of kind of segment them but obviously they don't work in in that way so I think um social care and mental health teams I think um as I mentioned the um well two things the the schools in reach service that's a real um 
really interesting concept to bring those two together through the school then as well. Um, so, as I said, I think some people, so in services was based in um, mental health teams, but they often had people working there who had been practitioners in social care so that they knew the processes, they knew the systems, and that really helped in them working together with the school as well. Um, and so similarly with the um, the virtual school as well, although that was more social care and, and less mental health. I think, yeah, I think the gap around that joint work is, I think that was that was quite strong for schools. Mm. I think it was less strong for um, colleges. That's where those those links and those, that three way link between those sectors seem to break down more. Yeah. Um, no, that makes that makes a lot of sense, and I think there are there are real challenges not just between how you know mental health and social care services work with each other, but but wider services as well. Um, I know you mentioned that colleges you know, potentially social social workers were less involved or less active in, in young people's lives once they were in college. And maybe that was to do with young people wanting more independence. But the other side of it is, you know, young people don't get as much resource from social care once mm-hmm. they get to that age. And um, there's kind of less of a, a focus on kind of visits and, um, you know, potentially that they're, they're kind of seen as being more independent, even if they don't necessarily feel it. I was wondering if there was anything in your qualitative data or all the quantitative data that looked at kind of for those older children who were in college, kind of what their living environments were. So whether they were still living with foster carers or whether they were in, you know, their own independent accommodation or supported accommodation or unregulated accommodation as well, because we know there's that 16 to 18 kind of period of time for, for care experiencing people, which can be really challenging, especially if they're kind of out on their own so the um so for the quant- quantitative data sorry i didn't present on on that today but oh, so that's, that's okay. that was secondary school only so we didn't have college data um from that side um yeah but colleges certainly spoke um the college staff we spoke to um certainly sp- spoke about that and it included um what they'd observed in terms of um, more young people being estranged from families, um, a shift towards um, more living in kinship care, but they also spoke about um, some moving into sort of informal kinship care. So it was maybe students living with another student and their families. So it was a lot more variety and range. Um, and there were concerns that came through about um, moving into independent living and how what what's, what other support networks they'd have around them at that time. So there was. They, they think they, they they were there were a lot of concerns there um and about the limits to what they could do in those situations as well yeah um and I think that kind of uh, a couple of people mentioned about um potentially the basic income pilot and and how that might be another policy that's kind of in in intersecting with kind of children's well-being and mental health and I think you did mention about the the financial support there i i wonder so you just you mentioned that that felt like a, a protective factor for, for mental health and well-being and was that something that came up a lot or was it kind of a a, a small area that people talked about yeah that's an interesting question i think um i need to look back at the data i think it came did come up in most of the college interviews actually um and so yeah, it was a protective factor in terms of um, it's something that helped them. But I probably there probably is another side. There's probably a bit more nuance to that that I could have pulled out um, because a lot of the um, the staff, college staff in particular, talked about management of money as well and how maybe you know often young people are thrust into that position of trying to manage money at maybe an early, a much earlier age for um, care experience, young people and others. Um, and how they, maybe there wasn't support to to the, there wasn't even support that they could offer really to to manage that. Um, so I think yeah I think there's there's a bit more nuance that we probably should have should have brought out there around that. And it'd be yeah really interesting. I came to the um, the basic income pilot presentation last week, and there's a lot of um, really interesting looking at their sort of logic model in terms of how you know the the um, the income is is related to. Um, 
sense of belonging and relationships. So there's a lot of crossover, I think, with um, things that we've been looking at today. Yeah. And I think I think that's one of the challenges, isn't it? That like actually there are so many different things that are impacting on, on these these young people that aren't they can't just be addressed by school or mental health services or social care. It's actually thinking about that much wider um offer and kind of what are the kind of determinants of kind of good well-being and mental health for this group. And and I think that might be what's quite unique to this group than than some of the other groups that people have talked about. Um, and I think, yeah, I think I think you've kind of brought that out really strongly in the presentation, actually. So yeah, I really appreciate that. Um, there was something else that I kind of there was a couple of things I wanted to ask, but if anyone else have any other questions, also pop them in the chat. Um, so there's a group called the Care Leaders. I don't know if you've heard of them, and they're mainly based in England, but they're a group of care experienced um, people who kind of campaign around kind of trying to change policies and practices um, based on the messages that care experiencing people kind of keep telling researchers and practitioners and policymakers. But their current campaign is around the school day and how kind of um, holding social work meetings, for example, during the school day or in schools can be really stigmatizing for children and young people. And I just wonder if you had like, were there any examples of people really trying to change that in the schools that you worked with? Because you did mention it, but but the, the challenge is kind of professionals working hours, right? Are they going to hold a meeting on a, a Saturday, um, you know, or are they going to do it in the school? So I just wonder if you had any examples of that working well. That's really interesting. I'll have a look at the, um, the care leaders campaign as well. Thank you. Um, so it was it was mainly presented from what I'm recalling, I think it was mainly presented as something that needed change that, rather than anything that had changed. Um, I think as, especially as I talked about in the college context. So, you know, in college, some people might have been in college for some of the time, but they may have also been doing part-time work. And it was just sort of another thing they had to juggle and fit in, really. Um, so there were examples of maybe meetings taking place when they were on their break in work, which wasn't ideal and, and things like that. Um, but I think, again, it's that, I suppose, the starting point is that um, those college staff, so college staff spoke about that rather than the students. So they have an awareness of it. So that was a starting point for hopefully putting in place um, a better setup. Um, and thinking about schools, I think in um, some of the young people we spoke to, it's quite interesting. So um, I think, yeah, some of them had meetings in the school day. I think some of them had actually chosen, and I think I'd have to look back, but I'm sure this was their, their choice. They'd actually chosen to be at home for the meeting. And I'm sure there was a contrast between two, two learners that we spoke to. Um, one had a preference for really having it in school um, so they could get straight back into their lessons. And someone else was having, um, had a preference to have actually have the meetings at home. Um, so there seemed to be an element of young person, young people's choice there, um, yeah. which was coming in a little bit, but not not extensively. Yeah, I guess my challenge there would be that it sounds like a choice between two bad options. Yeah. So, you know, do you want to finish the meeting and go straight back into a, mm. a lesson when maybe you've been talking about something really distressing? Or do you want to miss your whole school day and do it at home, but at least you don't have to go straight into yeah. a really distressing yeah you know, a lesson when you've had that experience. So to me, that that seems like maybe an element of choice, but a choice between two things that aren't great yeah. ideal. Um, so we've had it, we had a question as well about, and maybe I can broaden this out because I don't think you kind of purposefully sampled groups of children who were adopted and things like that. But um, I wonder if there was any kind of key differences between challenges that, kind of children who'd been adopted talked about or potentially children who were in kind of kinship care or children who were in foster care, if there was anything that kind of came across that was kind of different from those groups. And I don't expect you to have a kind of really, really um, clear um, difference there. No, that's that's a great question. Thank you. Um, so I think in the present, the, the findings I presented, um, the main difference was with um, the gaps for adopted um, children and young people. So that came through quite quite clearly. Um, I guess what I didn't include um, 
So speaking to schools in particular, um, I think they commented on how maybe foster carers seem more used to dealing with schools. I think social workers um, commented on that as well. They often help them navigate perhaps um, kinship carers um, weren't as used to dealing with schools um, or, or maybe had a bad experience previously with schools. Um, perhaps harder to get to get them to get them into the school or, or to discuss pointless points of contact. Um, I mean, one one important thing that I haven't presented, so it came through really strongly in the um, in the quantitative findings, was about the differences for those in residential care. Yeah. Um, so we did look at different different groups there. So overall, um, care experience groups had poor mental health and well being compared to the general population, which has been confirmed, which confirms previous findings from other studies. Um, but within the groups, foster care, um, kinship care, and residential care, resident those in residential care had poorer mental health and well being um, outcomes um, as well. So that's something to focus on. And interestingly as well, um, I think there were findings there about um, poorer relationships and from the quantitative data, poorer relationships with teachers between those in residential care as well. So there's a few things there that we need to look at in a little bit more detail, but um, yeah, definitely pull out some of the differences um, more clearly. Yeah. So really good. Well, Thanks for that question. That sounds good. I, th I think there's a kind of follow-up question in there around whether you kind of spoke to adoptive parents and also foster carers and if there were differences in what they perceived the gaps to be as opposed to what children potentially and, and teachers might perceive the gaps to be. Okay, so um, so the main, we spoke to adoptive parents and foster carers um, as part of the consultation group and that's where their voices came through most strongly because we had, we had more people attending those. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, there were similar similarities in terms of um, issues with school. Um, a lot of it, um, there was quite a lot of mixed responses there in terms of a lot of around carer battles, mm. um, trying to deal with schools or trying to have um, a line of contact with schools. And I think what we found and what came through there was that it's, there was a sense of potluck um, it depended where you are, whether you had good links or a good contact in school. And that really, really varied um, across different schools, um, across primary and secondary as well. Um, and so that's, that's, that, was, that was the main difference, I suppose. I think yeah. when we went to the case study schools, um, they were far more sort of positive interactions that they portrayed with, with parents and carers. Um, they seem to have much better links in with local communities um, and with adoptive parents and carers there as well. Yeah. Um, no, that's that's really helpful. And I think you're always going to get that slight difference, aren't you? Because the schools that are open to kind of exploring some of these questions, maybe are the ones that have been trying to put things in place or have that better understanding um, than maybe some other schools, you know, that, that wouldn't necessarily engage as much whereas parents and carers are going to have a much broader experience of some good schools some bad schools some kind of individuals within schools who've who've managed things really well um I think we're coming to the end now um if that's right Sarah we I've, I think I've addressed all of the questions I hope I have if I haven't directly addressed people's questions I hope I've at least addressed the theme of the question um, is there anything final that you kind of wanted to to say or signpost people to, Sarah? Um, nothing, as nothing so far. All the all the examples are in the presentation, and I'm happy to, for that to be shared so you can um, you can follow those links. And please, please get in touch today um, afterwards if there was something else that you wanted to, wanted to ask. But thanks very much for your questions. It's certainly given given me some more things to think about. So I really appreciate that. Yeah, no, that's great. Oh, thank you so much, Sarah. Um, and I just wanted to flag, we do have a, um, an exchange conference that's taken place over the autumn, so across October. Um, and the theme of the conference is learning disabilities. Um, so the conference is called Being Seen, Heard and Valued. Um, I think there should be some links hopefully shared about that, but please sign up um, to, to webinars throughout the month. There'll be blogs um, all around the theme 
and it's a it's a really we've got some really impressive speakers um i think people will will learn a lot from that that's not just focusing on children's social care but actually thinking about learning disabilities um more broadly um and yeah just thank you again sarah for your presentation it was really informative thank you everyone who came along um for your questions and thank you to the exchange team for putting it together it does take a lot of work to put these to put these seminars on so yeah thank you very much Thank you. Bye.